Thank you. You may be seated. Passing it on, child training part four. I hope you listen to that second verse there. Your love extends to every generation with joyful news of your redemption plan. Passing it on. That's why we have the gospel today. There have been faithful men and women who have even died for their faith so that it might be brought down to us today. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of text that we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 through 28. Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Now, I'm not going to tell you when, but there is going to be an exam, <laughs> and you've had your second chance. Remember, three strikes and you're out, that kind of thing. So now is your second chance with that little paper that's in your bulletin today with the budak, the little outline of how do you remember the ten plagues of Egypt. We're dealing with the plagues of really a combination right now of darkness and death of the firstborn. We've finished darkness, but I'm going to be saying more about that today because it is necessary for us to understand fully what's going on with the plague of death and the Passover and then the exodus from Egypt itself, getting to a very exciting point in the text where the children of Israel actually walk out. They leave it behind. All the stuff of this world. Are you ready for that? Someday you will walk out and leave all the stuff of earth behind. All the leeks and the lentils and the garlics and all the things that they loved there in Egypt. Oh, then they get into the wilderness. They tend to forget about the suffering that they've had in the land of Egypt about the bad times, but they remember the good times. How many of us are like that here in this world? We remember all the good times and forget the things that are important. The good times, the fun stuff, not realizing that we were in slavery, like Israel, with all those good times. Well, back to our text. You've got your bulletin inserts there, many, many different ones. Astounding to me just exactly how Satan uses so many things to attack the Christian faith. I mean, everything from this bigamist so-called pastor who's a former mafia enforcer, and now he's a, quote, pastor, and he's insisting, and I told you about this. Remember last summer I, I did a presentation at the Dean Bergen Society on Mormonism versus the King James Version, the Mormon Holy Books versus the King James, and in that... I did a whole section on polygamy and the Obergefell v. Hodges case had just come down and um, I had predicted, I said, you know, right now that opens the door for polygamy, legalizing polygamy, because every argument that is used in Obergefell can be used in precisely the same manner to support polygamy. And then a few weeks later, I reported to you that there were already several cases that had made their way into the pipeline, different Mormons who were suing at that point to have their plural marriages recognized. Now we have it coming over to what the world sees as Christians. I'd also mention that there are those, there are those who are so-called Christian polygamists who believe the Bible supports polygamy have nothing to do with Mormonism. People, Satan uses that kind of thing. He's destroying our culture. But that one about the Pastafarians, who believe in the <laughs> this horrible flying spaghetti monster god, um, <laughs> you know, it, it boggles the mind. That's a mockery of God, but the world will buy into it. They will give them legal rights. You read the article, they're getting legal rights for their bizarre organization, the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. And pasta spaghetti, they're Pastafarians, not Rastafarians, Pastafarians and so they wear colanders on their head. And you know what that makes the world think about religion? I mean, Satan attacks from every different direction. Don't just think that he's always going to attack one direction. He attacks all over the place to bring shame and reproach to the true and living God and make people think that divine reality is a hoax. Well, anyway, I'll let you read those articles in your own time. But right now we're talking about child training, passing it on. If you don't, your Christian heritage is at stake as this country is radically exploding and imploding. And it's happening. That's what those articles are about there. That's why I stuck them into your bulletins today. We've already seen how Paul cites the Passover and the Exodus narratives tied to eight key doctrines in Romans 11 that stem from Christ fulfilling the Passover and its typology. So if you're going to start someplace to pass something on to your children, start there. 
Remember what those doctrines were? There are eight of them, at least eight ones, that are Paul cites there in Romans. The remnant principle, judgmental blindness, we'll be talking more about that today. Chastening and loss of rewards, eternal security, restoration of blessing for repentance, guaranteed future in the land of promise for national Israel, something that is being rapidly forgotten today. God has promised it. It will happen in spite of the fact that we have uh, leaders who do not believe that or stand for it. The permanent nature of the covenants of God and the spiritual gifts and the grace of God. Lots of important things that are tied back to Passover. Hope you know what they are. We saw that God uses Satan as his instrument of judgment and judgmental blindness, not only for wicked pagans, but also for believers. We need to teach that to our children. Or they can come under the chastening hand of God, even to the point of God using Satan to chasten them. That is a scary thing. Have you taught that kind of thing to your children and grandchildren? When was the last time you taught it to them? We also saw that many of the passages teach us that chastening is actually a manifestation of God's grace. God disciplines his children because he loves his children. And we're supposed to reflect his earthly fathers, our heavenly fathers. If we fail to pass things on through our discipline by the rod, which reinforces the teaching aspect, it makes them understand, hey, my dad thinks this is important. <laughs> then they're going to come under judgmental blindness at some point. We saw how true believers, even heroes of faith, can reach a point of no return. We gave Samson, sex-saturated Samson, as the illustration of how he lost his freedom, his honor, his sight, his position of authority as a judge in Israel, and it ultimately it cost him his life. We talked about how God judges carnal believers who are involved in sin. And he judges them severely because, after all, we are his representatives. Expect a heavy hand from the Father when you are representing him and you fail to do it. In the text today, Moses is reminding them. He gives them the setting for that first Passover. It's the setting of darkness and judgmental blindness. And we talked about that in relation to different sins, and we've covered those in the past, so i just go through it quickly. Have you hardened your heart to the one who declared that he himself is the light of the world, darkness versus light? Are you walking in the flesh, lusting after the leeks and lentils of Egypt? Is your gluttonous belly your God? Is your mind saturated with sex? Are you lazy, slothful, indolent? And a sluggard, is your heart filled with envy? Are you greedy, covetous, worm chained to the temporal garbage of earth? Are you angry and bitter, jealous and petty, manipulative and focused on trivia? Are you so proud that you refuse to admit your own sin? A lot of different things that we could pull out of this text here that we see happening in Israel after they leave Egypt. And look, after they've been delivered, those are sins that show up in their lives. You've left Egypt. You've trusted Christ. You've said, I put it all behind me, but you still keep going back in your heart. You know, the problem was not getting Israel out of Egypt. God was quite proficient at doing that and glorified himself in doing it. It wasn't the problem was not getting Israel out of Egypt. The problem was getting Egypt out of Israel. And the same thing is true with us. God getting Egypt out of our hearts. So in that context, I reported to you two weeks ago that I'd recently received complaints from the elders that my teaching was not clear. And that was rather interesting because it didn't occur to me until just this week that that complaint came in the context of me preaching on darkness and judgmental blindness. That got me thinking about that big question of why the complaint was passed and raised. I realized that it also had a perfect tie-in with the topic of the mini-series that we're doing right now on child training. So move me to print out the outline sheets that you've got in your bulletins. You'll be getting those every week from now on. They'll look exactly the same. You're the one that has to take the notes. I'm not writing the notes for you. You have to take the notes. But uh, those will be in your bulletins every week. That is if Joanne remembers to put them in the bulletins. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne, for doing that. <laughs> um, but uh, nobody can ever wish they had something to write on. So I've given you a few biblical insights when I got meditating on that question, why don't they understand? And I want to expand on that first one, which is my failure. The first obvious reason, which is the complaint that the elders made, is that I am really not clear. In which case, the blame certainly falls squarely at my feet. And I will confess it to you, if that is the problem, I have sinned. And if you can point out specific instances, don't give me generalities, if you can point out specific instances where habitually I fail to communicate clearly, then please let me know. You help me by doing that. Okay? But don't make vague generalities and vague allusions to his unclarity. When you find something you don't understand, the way to find out the answer is what? You ask a question. But 
That could be the result of at least one or a combination of several things, and I've added these since the last time we talked on this subject. Here are some reasons why I might not be unclear, or why I might be clear. <laughs> why might not I be clear? Why uh, not might I be clear? <laughs> you get the idea? Here they are, at least eight of them. It could be my own disorganization. I know there are times when I've been totally scrambled in my life and totally disorganized. It's not habitual. Uh, I try very hard not to make it habitual, but it might be my own disorganization. It might be my irrational application of the text. I read the text and then I tell you something. You say, how in the world did he get to that conclusion? I don't see that anywhere in the text. It's not there. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And then I begin to talk to you uh, about um, something out of the book of Jonah that has to do with how big fish are. You know, it might be that I have an irrational application of the text. The third possibility is my irresponsible exegesis of the text. In other words, I jump into the text and I wade around swimming in the text, and but I don't do any exegesis of the text. I fail to deal with what the text is actually saying. Number four, it might be my incoherent sentence structure or lack or excess of vocabulary. And some people tell me I talk to too big words, my words are too big, okay. I will try to talk in simple baby talk if you need it, but I think most of you are adults. I think most of you have heard the English language long enough that you know most of the words, at least, that I use. And the ones that you don't understand, ask me what it means. I'll be happy to tell you. Because I want you to grow. I want you to understand. Did you know that God inspired the scripture in words? He didn't inspire it in concepts. Every word of God is pure. The answer is, thy words giveth light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Not thy concepts are truth. You know, that's a very important thing to remember. The verbal, inerrant, plenary, confluent, plenary inspiration of Scripture. Every word was inspired by God. Jesus based his arguments for his deity upon the tense of a verb. When we look at the scripture, we need to understand God-inspired words. If I said to you, there's something in the parking lot. Well, there might be a lot of things in the parking lot. There's a bus in the parking lot. There are different cars in the parking lot. There are rocks in the parking lot. There is grass growing up in the cracks in the parking lot. There are animals walking across the parking lot. When I say there's something in the parking lot, you're getting a general vague idea, but you don't know what I'm talking about. If I said there's something big in the parking lot, well, that would probably eliminate the animals, and that would probably eliminate the little rocks. And it might be the bus, and it might be the cars. Maybe what I'm referring to is the whole parking lot itself and the asphalt. That's pretty big. The way in which you communicate concepts is with precise words. I want you to learn precise words. That's why I talk about things like imputation, redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, atonement, remission, and so on. And the differences between them. The doctrines of the cross, all are precise words. Justification, imputation. You know, those are important words to understand the distinctions between. So I explain them. God communicated in words, in human language, in real human language, and the words have meaning. So if you don't understand the words, ask me, I'll tell you. But the only way to express precise concepts is with precise words. God expressed his truth in words. And so I try to use precise words, and I hope you understand, and when you don't, please ask me. Another possibility is my failure to build a foundation upon which the subject can be understood. I hope you understand that I try to lay a foundation because I review every week. I tell you what I said last week. I tell you what I'm going to say today. Then I say it, and then I told you what I just said, and then I review it next week. <laughs> That's called building a foundation. You have to do that in law. You have to build a foundation before you can make your case. Maybe I failed to do that. 
Another possibility is my failure to teach the subject matter in the correct order so that things make sense. In other words, instead of starting off in first grade with addition, I hit you with the calculus. Well, obviously you won't understand it. I haven't taught things in the correct order. In other words, starting with the simple things first to build upon them. Now, most of you folks here, I think, probably think of yourselves as having a pretty good foundation, having learned the basics. And so we go on from there, although I throw in simple things every week just for those who may not be at that point of maturity yet. But that's a possibility. My failure to teach the subject matter in the correct order so that things make sense. There's also the possibility, and there are plenty of radio preachers out there whom everybody loves and television preachers, but my failure to actually teach but only give illustrations, jokes, personal experiences, and stories. And there are a lot of guys out there, and boy, people love to listen to them, but they're not teaching the scripture. The gift that God has given to me in the list of spiritual gifts, one of the four leadership gifts, is the gift of pastor-teacher. You know, there's not a gift of pastor by itself. There is a gift of teacher by itself, but there's not a gift of pas pastor by itself. It's pastor-teacher. If, if you study the Greek structure where Paul gives those lists of gifts, you'll discover it's the gift of pastor-teacher. So I have not only the responsibility as a shepherd, but also a communicator of the truth of God. Do I fail to teach? I hope that is not said of me. Because that would all result in your lack of education on the subject matter. Obviously, my failure would be that I have first failed to educate you. The element of teaching that we discussed in the three-legged stool illustration that I gave a couple of weeks ago, dealing with child training. The three foundational areas of passing it on to your children and grandchildren. The area of teaching, the area of discipline, the area of example. Am I failing to live it in front of you? If you remove any one of those lessons, you'll not successfully train your children either in the fear of the Lord. So we looked at the content of my messages between a half and two-thirds of the actually carefully organized quotations and citations of Bible verses. And the naked scripture itself should be able to enter your heart and give you understanding. If the entrance of thy words giveth light, scripture says so. So why don't some folks understand? I looked at Jesus. This is a review, remember? I'm just reviewing very fast, reviewing what we covered two weeks ago. Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever lived. Nobody could say that he was not clear. He quoted a lot of verses out of the Old Testament to make his points, even though he could actually speak Scripture because what he said was the Word of God. But you know, it was amazing how many times in the Gospels Jesus was not understood. People didn't understand Jesus, and he was the best teacher there ever was. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us flesh to eat? John 6, 59, These things said he in the synagogue when he taught in Capernaum. Many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? And those the disciples murmured at it. You know, you look at these things. Over in the Gospel of Matthew, we find the Jews are offended at what he says because they're focused on the wrong thing. We know his brothers, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, and they're not all with us. Whence then hath this man all these things? They're focused on the wrong things so they didn't understand. What are you focused on? They were offended at him. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. There's also something in Scripture that I think is very plain. God chooses to whom he will give light. And if you're not getting light, it's not a problem with God. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Sovereign hand of God is at work in things like that. We talked about the different obvious reasons people don't understand. Some have physical handicap, they're blind or deaf. Some have mental handicaps, they can't intellectually grasp what's being said. Some have language difficulties, they don't speak the English language, and I preach in English, obviously, just like Paul and Jesus preached in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek, so you could definitely have said that you did not understand them if you heard them preach. Some have cultural differences, they don't understand the idioms that you use, so try to speak cross-culturally, even when both speak the same, same language is sometimes difficult. Some of the biblical reasons people don't understand why you need to pass it on to your children and specifically what you need to pass on to them. 
If you don't understand it, your kids aren't going to understand it. If you don't apply it, your kids aren't going to apply it. If you don't live it, your kids aren't going to live it. How are you going to pass it on? How are you going to pass it on? The first reason, people don't understand. And that's what the, the, the striking thing that suddenly hit me this week, because we've been talking about judgmental blindness. <laughs> the first reason, I didn't give you this one last time, though we've been talking about judgmental blindness. The first reason people under, understand is judgmental blindness. The first obvious answer, particularly in light of what we've been studying about the plague of darkness and the judgmental blindness, which, by the way, you remember that was one of those eight in that list of the great truths that we have to pass on to our children. We're talking about passing things on to our children. There's a critical juncture in the life of this nation, in the life of this church, in the life of every person sitting here today or listening over the Internet. We're at a critical juncture of our lives. What are you passing on to your children? One of the possibilities is judgmental blindness, that this church may be going through a period of judgmental blindness for failing to obey the truth that we have clearly been taught and intellectually know. You've been warned. Some of you have been scolded. And you harden your heart and say, I will not do it because I don't like it. You know who you are. I won't point out any names, but you know who you are. Key principle. What are the key principle out of this that we get from this judgmental blindness issue? The failure to apply A-P-P-L-Y, English word, easy word. The failure to apply doctrine in holy living always results in judgmental blindness. Where are you hardening your heart? Where are you being stiff-necked? Where are you being stubborn and rebellious like Israel who had to be broken? He that hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be broken and that without remedy. God will not... This is a very important principle. This is one I learned way, way back in early, early teen years. God will not give you more light until you obey the light that you already have. God will not give you more light... We always want to know more light down the road there. God says, do what I tell you now. Obey this. Well, but Lord, that, that doesn't interest me. What interests me is this over here. God says, obey this, and then I'll give you light on that. But I will not give you light on that until you obey me now, doing what I told you to do now. What have you shoved under the rug in your heart? Something you know that you ought to be doing now. God will not give you more light until you obey the light you already have. It's a matter of walking in the light. Do you know how many times it talks about in the New Testament walking in the light? Not lollygagging around in the light, not lounging in the light, not sitting around in the light, not resting in the light, not just standing in the light. When it talks about light, it talks about walking in the light. As the light moves forward, if you keep standing still in the same place pretty soon, you know what? You're going to be in darkness. You've got to walk in the light as he is in the light so that you can have fellowship with God the Father and with God the Son and with one another. Walking in the light. John 1, starting in verse 5, Then this then is the message that we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Remember, we're talking about plague of darkness. Okay, What are we supposed to be passing on to our children? Here is a, an epistle written to the little children and the young men and the fathers. It's an epistle that's for every age level. Whether you're spiritually a little kid, or whether you're spiritually a mature man, or whether you're spiritually an old man in the faith, it's written to you. And where does he start? With a very basic principle, which takes us back to the plague of darkness and judgmental blindness at the Exodus. In him is no darkness at all. If we say... Now, you know, a lot of folks here claim to be in fellowship. I think probably all of you would claim to be in fellowship. If you think, I'm not in fellowship, I'm proud of it, I'm not in fellowship, raise your hand. What, no hands? <laughs> of course not. We all think we're in fellowship, don't we? Okay, if you say that you have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, God says you're a liar. We lie and do not the truth, not believe not the truth. You may believe the truth. It's a question of are you doing the truth? If you don't understand, why not? Maybe you've got judgmental blindness because you've refused to obey what you know. You do not the truth. 
You say, oh, I'm in fellowship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and God, we're, we're pretty tight buddies. If you're not doing the truth, if you're not walking in the light, you're walking in darkness. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth. That's a, a continuous tense. Continually is cleansing us from all sin. Daily habitual practice of having your sins washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ. Don't think you know what you are not practicing. Let me say that again. Don't think you know what you are not practicing. Luke 11.35, here's Jesus' words on the subject. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Think, I got light, and what you really got is darkness. Don't think that you know what you are not practicing. John 3.19, and this is the condemnation. Remember, we're talking judgmental blindness. It is all over the Scripture, all over the Gospels, all over the Epistles, not just the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. This is the condemnation, that's judgment. That light has come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You say, well, I've got these deeds here, and, you know, when the light shines on them, it doesn't make me look very good. So, what I will do is I will pretend darkness is light. I will say I'm in fellowship with God. I'll keep on doing the things that I want to do, the things in my thoughts, the things that come out of my mouth, the, the actions that I do, the secret things that I look at on the Internet, you know, the porn magazines that I slide under my bed. <laughs> people. This is the condemnation. We're talking judgmental blindness. The light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. A man's theology and his morals always go hand in hand. What you really believe will show up in your life. You can talk about believing something else, but what you really believe shows up in your life. It changes the way you live. It controls the way you live. It motivates the way you live. It motivates the way you think, the way you talk, the things you do. It motivates you. It controls your attitudes. Friends, judgmental darkness still is happening. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. Jesus is the light. Jesus is walking. If you stand here, the light goes away. He that followeth me. That means your life is conformed to Christ. What are you doing with what you know? Not what are you believing. You've got to believe the right thing. Obviously, you start there. But what are you doing with what you believe? John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That is, you say, well, you know, I've I believed on Jesus, but I really sort of like it over here in the shadows. I like to live in the shadows. That's abiding. Abiding is living in the place. Are you still living in the shadows? Or are you irresistibly drawn to the flame of the light of the love of Christ so that it transforms you. Here are some verses that might describe some in our church, at least some, and explain the problem that we were facing. Romans 2.18 Okay, here you got your head knowledge, guys. So you know His will and approve us the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. So you got it together. You got your theology down pat. Bang, 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 bang. Knowest his will. Yeah. Here's the will of God. And approve us the things that are more excellent. Good boy. Being instructed out of the law. I've been taught. I've been the BPC for the last 337 years from day one. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind. Those guys that can't see out there, I can show them. A light of them which are in darkness. I've run into that attitude a few times. 
oh man, I still have so much more to learn. And I know it. I hope you know that too. I'm constantly amazed as I read Scripture. And I kick myself and say, why didn't I ever see that before? I've been studying the Scripture for 221 years and 14 days and 37 minutes. And I never saw that before. When you approach God's Word, you approach it with humility and with weeping. Every morning when I have my prayer time and read Scripture, I often weep as I'm reading through Scripture, as God points things out in my life that need to be made right. Do you ever have that experience? Where the Word of God is penetrating your heart, not pointing at somebody else. Art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law. You know it. You got your catechism memorized. Well, maybe your catechism is mesmerized instead of memorized. If you don't know what mesmerized means, talk to me afterwards. But notice the next few verses. Here's the guy who thinks he's got it together. Now, here's what comes next, verse 21. Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? In other words, are you applying what you know? Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? By the way, that reminds me. There are the new pens out there, available. They're straight pens like this. Thank you, Paul. There are these ones with a padded, cushiony grip on them. They belong to the church. They do not belong to you. I did not put them there so you could put them in your purse or in your pocket. Okay? Return the pens. Thou shalt not steal. Remember? Okay. Thou that sayest, thou shalt not steal, dost thou steal? Hmm. Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, Dost thou look at pornography? Jesus said, A man who looks on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her in his heart already. Women, you can do that too. By looking at a man. What's in your heart? Are you practicing what you're preaching? Thou that abhorrest idols. Dost thou commit sacrilege? You say, oh man, I, I don't like idols. I wouldn't have anything to do with idols, really. Question for you. What does Colossians 3, 5 and Ephesians 5, 5 say? One little phrase in there. Two verses. In fact, in fact Paul gives it to us twice. It should make an impression on us. Colossians 3, 5, Ephesians 5, 5. Covetousness is idolatry. And the covetous man is an idolater. You say you are um, one who abhors idols. Do you commit sacrilege? That is, you're involved in idolatry. Covetousness is idolatry. Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Paul's writing to people who had an incredible knowledge of Scripture. They had Paul as their personal teacher. He said, yeah, you got your act together theologically, at least in appearance. You got it in your head, but it hasn't moved into your hands. You see, believing so-called is not enough. It's how you respond by action to the truth that you know in your head. A good illustration is James 2.19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But that is not going to get them to heaven, and it certainly is not going to get them heavenly rewards. Solution. How to avoid the plague of darkness in this church. Ephesians 5.8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
At one point in our lives, all of us were darkness. We were in darkness. The question is, what are we going to do about it now? He says, walk as children of light. Start walking. Keep walking. Don't stop walking. Stay as close to the light as you possibly can. How about down in verse 11? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful work of darkness, but rather reprove them. It's not merely enough to walk in the light and to keep following the light. But when you see darkness, you don't move into the shadows. Instead, you reprove darkness. When was the last time you spoke up to somebody who was doing something wicked and said, that's wrong? Two words. That's all you have to say. That's wrong. They'll say to you, well, who do you think you are? Judge not that you be not judged. And so I say, oh, well, let's quote the rest of Matthew chapter 5. Before with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. With what measure you meet, you shall be, it shall be measured to you again. And it's not a matter of not judging at all. It's a matter of making sure you're not a hypocrite when you judge. Paul says concerning the man who is committing immorality in the church in Corinth, concerning that man, he says, I've judged already. You need to throw him out of the church, turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh and the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Don't let people batter you with that verse. They don't know the context. They wouldn't know where to find it if they had to. They don't even know that Jesus said it. Dear people, the first issue is walk as children of light. You know what it means. You know it in your head. Do it. Second issue is reprove darkness. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them. Third, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Recognize that you are in a life and death struggle. This is not a walk in the park. <laughs> I saw a card the other day. I was looking for a birthday card for somebody, and this one said, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> your 40th birthday is like a walk in the park. And you open it up, it says, Central Park at 2 a.m., wearing a T-shirt that says, I carry cash. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> We're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against the evil powers of hell. Against the rulers, not the minions, the rulers of the darkness of this world. Why do you think this world is in darkness? It has rulers who are keeping it in darkness. We're not talking about people. We're talking about spirit beings, demons. Have you girded yourself with the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20? Are you wearing every piece of the armor of God every day? You're doing battle, whether you know it or not. You are in a war. The bullets are being fired. Are you wearing the armor of God? If you're not, expect a bullet to the head. dangerous times we live in but then you have a power upon which you can rely and this is how to avoid that plague Colossians 1.13 who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son now let's talk about it for a moment where the rubber meets the road how about shoe leather here's the practical application how do you get along with other believers 1 John 2.11 he that hateth his brother is in darkness. Hey, we're talking Christians because he says your brother. First John is an epistle to those who are already children of God. And he's telling them how they're supposed to live. So here's one Christian and here's another Christian and the one Christian, man, I hate him. And I sure hate that preacher because of all the stuff he's saying because it really applies to me and I think he's talking to me right now. What did it say? He that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whether he goeth because that darkness has blinded his eyes. That's a pretty pointed verse. How's your heart in relation to other believers? Dear folks, if every Christian believed and practiced that verse, there would never be any church splits. There would never be any party politics in the body of Christ. There would never be any divisions. We'd move forward with power in the Spirit of God 
doing war together as a single unit because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So back to the issue. So you don't understand. What are you doing with the light that you already have? Remember, the issue is not just believing it. The issue is doing it. Here's what Jesus said, Matthew 5, starting in verse 14. Ye are the light of the world. Now, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world, but you know what he said about us? Because we're supposed to reflect him? Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In other words, you've got to make it visible. You've got to not only believe it in your head, you've got to live it in your life. That's what genuine faith is anyway. Remember the walk of faith? Walking in the Spirit? Walking in the light? You're moving forward. The second reason, and can you believe it, our time is up. Well, you know what? We'll stop with having finished the first reason, which you did not hear last time that I talked about this, but at least we covered some new material today. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It does remind us that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to your purpose. I would never have been preaching any of this stuff or even thinking about these things, except somebody in your sovereign will brought a criticism that I wasn't clear. So I thank you, Father, for the Bible study that you've given to me and for the new insights and for the opportunity to share it with your people. And whatever the problem is here, Father, we pray that you will cleanse it and remove it in a way that most perfectly glorifies your Son. You are a good and gracious Father. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We pray that you'll help us to live the Scripture, not merely talk about them. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.